In our last video, we explored the astonishing discovery recently made upon the Giza Plateau. Hidden in plain sight, another great sphinx. However, this doppelganger of the better-known, long-claimed sole guardian of the Great Pyramids seemingly possesses a greater level of undiluted erosion, indicative of both sculptures' tremendous age. The questions are, however, just how great is their age? How long have the Sphinx, or indeed the Great Pyramids, been here on our planet? Furthermore, the tremendous levels of erosion seen on the pyramids themselves. Not only do the pyramids display a level of erosion indicative of a prehistoric timeline, but they have seen many additional efforts by a number of now lost civilizations, each far more capable in regards to stonework than the modern man, created a number of layers of far less eroded casing stones, each displaying a varying age, this evidence indicative of several attempts at conservation. These factors all but support the following posit, made by a number of researchers all claiming that the Sphinx, and indeed we feel, the pyramids themselves, are in actuality as much as 800,000 years old. The most recent studies were surprisingly presented at the International Conference of Geoarchaeology and Archaeomineralogy held in Sofia. Titled Geological Aspect of the Problem of Dating the Great Egyptian Sphinx Construction, the authors of this paper Mainstream scientist Monica Vacheslav from the Institute of Environmental Geochemistry of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and Alexander G. Parkomenko, Institute of Geography of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, have blown the whistle regarding what we have supported for a number of years. The starting point of these two experts is the paradigm shift, which has been initiated within the quote debate which has been intended to overcome the orthodoxy within Egyptology, referring to the possible remote origins of the Egyptian civilization, and, on the other, physical evidence of water erosion present at the monuments of the Giza Plateau, which, although suspiciously mainstream researchers such as West and Scotch have made over the years, specifically titles the water erosion controversy, which deliberately overlooked that the Sphinx, having once been recorded as having been surrounded by a body of water, namely Anubis Lake, meaning that the enclosure was once designed with the intent of holding water, itself in turn concealing the Sphinx's possible true identity. Instead, focuses on the erosion clearly made by rainfall and ancient water levels, features we indeed claim were later additions. According to Manichev and Parkomenko, quote, The problem of dating the Great Pyramid Sphinx construction is still valid despite the long-term history of its research. Geological approaches and other scientific methods permits us to answer the question about the relative age of the Sphinx. The conducted visual investigation of the Sphinx allow the conclusion regarding the important role of water from large bodies which partially flooded the monument, with the formation of wave-cut hollows on its vertical walls. The morphology of these formations has an analogy with similar such hollows, formed by the sea in the coastal zones. Genetic resemblance of the compared erosion forms and the geological structure and petrographic composition of sedimentary rock complexes leads to the conclusion of the existence of long-lived freshwater lakes within various periods of the lower Pleistocene era. These lakes were distributed in the territories adjacent to the Nile. The absolute mark of the upper large erosion hollow of the Sphinx corresponds to the level of water surface which took place in this early Pleistocene age." End quote. A link to the research can be found in the script. It is a vindicating exposure of ours and others' work, one which we find highly compelling. There are countless ancient uparts, which can be found littering ancient antiquities, and indeed the exhibits which are so often attributed to an ancient civilization subsequently debunked by said studies, as having been capable of such ancient developments. As such, these artifacts are known as out-of-place artifacts or uparts, as they have become affectionately known. 
One such artifact is that of the Wedge of Ayud, a large, clearly machined piece of metal made of high-purity aluminium, dated by many researchers as that of an ancient artifact. The problem is, aluminium in this density was not developed by modern man until the late 19th century, around 1825 to be precise. Weighing an impressive 5 pounds in weight, the wedge was originally dug up, found deep within the sediments of a riverbank in modern-day Romania, disregarded by many as that of a modern-day JCB tooth. There are just as many, however, who argue, and we feel for good reason as we shall reveal, that this artifact is indeed ancient and has, through the years, continued to raise difficult questions to answer. Ancient alien enthusiasts insist that the wedge is a segment of an ancient alien craft, or more specifically, a VTOL-type craft, better known as a vertical takeoff and landing craft, and the large visible signs of aging are supportive of not only a tremendous age, but of its currently unexplainable origins here on Earth. It was found during digging on a construction project along with two mastodon bones in 35 feet of sand. Someone gave it to the Museum of History of Transylvania, where it lay ignored in a storeroom for 20 years, before editors from a Romanian UFO magazine found it in 1995. Furthermore, although some skeptics attempt to argue that the wedge is of modern origins, it was found in the same layer as that of the mastodon bones with a wedge accepted by a large number of others as being at least 11,000 years old. This dating makes this a very peculiar item indeed, and something which we feel demands further examination. If the wedge is indeed around 11,000 years old, as the evidence, witness testimony, and dating of the sediments it was found within would suggest, then the question of how such a lump of almost pure, clearly machined aluminium originated from, and indeed, what was the original purpose of the wedge? Was it like the ancient alien enthusiasts insist once part of a vertical takeoff and landing craft? Or maybe from something else? Questions still circle the wedge's true origins, and without solid evidence to prove the wedge's modern origins, we must stick to the evidence already acquired that of the wedge's original resting place, the dating of said sediments, and the lack of any contradictory evidence in regards to works being done in this area at this depth along the riverbank within Romania. We must entertain the idea that this five-pound, almost pure metallic object is indeed that of an ancient upart, and any other explanation lacking evidence is just an attempt to disregard such claims as they do not jive with modern paradigm, an occurrence we witness all too often. What is the Wedge of Ayud? How old is it? Could it indeed be 11,000 years old? And if so, how was it manufactured and machined, and what could it have been possibly used for? It is an object which we find highly compelling.
the Tunguska River, Russia. At 7.14 in the morning on June 30, 1908, a mysterious, unexplained and deadly event occurred. During which, there was an enormous explosion. It has been estimated that the explosion was equal to more than 2,000 Hiroshima atom bombs, and for over a hundred years, no one has been able to figure out what caused it. At around breakfast time Mr. Semenov was sitting outside his house at Vanivara Trading Post, about 40 miles south of the edge of the explosion, he recalls the event, suddenly seeing directly to the north, over on Girls Tunguska Road, the sky split in two. Fire appeared high and wide over the forest. The split in the sky grew larger, and the entire northern side was covered with fire. At that moment, I became so hot that I couldn't bear it, as if my shirt was on fire. From the northern side, where the fire was, came strong heat. I wanted to tear off my shirt and throw it down, but then the sky shut closed, and a strong boom sounded. I was thrown a few meters. I lost my senses for a moment, then my wife ran out and led me to the house. After that such noise came, as if rocks were falling or cannons were firing, the earth shook, and when I was on the ground, I pressed my head down, fearing rocks would land on me. When the sky opened up, hot wind raced between the houses, which left traces in the ground like pathways, and it damaged the crops. This witness testimony was recorded in 1930 by Leonard Kalik's expedition. Although for many years scientists thought it was probably a meteor, the lack of evidence has led to numerous speculations ranging from UFOs to black holes. To this day, no one knows for sure what caused the explosion. During the explosion the fireball that ensued, witnessed by the handful of terrified, distant onlookers, a fireball witnessed as falling from the sky, was later estimated to have been many miles wide. What caused the Tunguska explosion? And most importantly what is buried at the epicenter of the event, or what was left on the earth. Whatever it is, for the past 100 years the only vegetation capable of surviving the location's environment is grass. The sheer force of the event destroyed trees far and wide, near ground zero damages were similar to those registered during atmospheric nuclear tests in the 1950s and 1960s. The trees directly below the explosion were stripped of their bark and snapped flat, while trees farther away were knocked over and uprooted. Interestingly, the explosion's pattern was in the shape of a butterfly. The Tunguska event is the largest impact event ever recorded on Earth. Studies have yielded different estimates of the object's size, depending on whether the body was a comet, a denser asteroid, or something else entirely. A team of researchers published analysis results of microsamples from a peat bog near the center of the affected area showing fragments that may be of meteoritic origin. Whether these fragments have been found to contain alien pollutants, has not been disclosed, but the physical evidence at the site would suggest a hostile chemical was released during the event, which even after a hundred years is still having a drastic effect on the landscape. It is estimated that the Tunguska explosion knocked down some 80 million trees over an area of 2,150 square kilometers, and that the shock wave from the blast would have measured 5.0 on the Richter magnitude scale. Whatever it was, this thing was big, also, there is clearly something that still remains at the location, and it isn't friendly to life.